No, no, it's not. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to call to order this meeting of the first five Sacramento Commission for Monday, November 6, 2017. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll and establish a quorum? Dave Gordon. Beth Hassett. Here. Terrence Jones. Olivia Kassiri. Paul Lake. Here. Scott Moak. Here. Donna Snaringer. Steve Wirtz. Here. Lee Turner Johnson. Here. Kathy Kosick. Here. Terry Porter, Christina Elliott, here. Patrick Kennedy, <laughs> Phil Cerna, here. We have a quorum. Thank you. This meeting of the first five Sacramento Commission is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T UVerse cable systems. This meeting is closed caption and webcast at www.sacmetrocable.tv. Today's meeting will be repeated Wednesday, November 8th at 6 p.m. on Channel 14. Members of the audience wishing to address the commission may sign a speaker slip at the kiosk located in the back of the room. Please include the agenda item number that you wish to address and then bring the completed form to me. Please speak into the microphone when addressing the commission and state your name for the record. If you have any electronic devices, please put them on silent or turn off now. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, will you please rise and join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone again to uh, this afternoon's uh, First Five Sacramento Commission meeting. And as a, another friendly reminder, uh, you're all welcome here in chambers to uh, address the board on, or the commission on any item that's on our agenda or any item that is not on our agenda we only ask that you please complete a speaker slip give it to our clerk you'll be called in the order uh, that the slip is received and we ask that you keep your comments to no more than three minutes so that everyone has a chance to address the commission if they so choose so with that our first item please approve the october 2nd 2017 draft action summary okay any commissioners wish to uh, suggest any changes if not i would entertain a motion Second. Second. Moved by Commissioner Leg, second by Commissioner Moak. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. Motion carries. Thank you. Next item, please. Public comments on non agenda items. Okay. Uh, this is the public's opportunity to address the Commission on any item that's not on the agenda. Does anyone wish to do so? Can't tell if that's someone that wants to speak to us on a non agenda item or not. I don't think so, okay. Um, all right, seeing as there's no one that is uh, interested in addressing the commission on non-agenda items, we'll move to item three, please. Executive Director's Report. Okay, very good, thanks. Good afternoon, commissioners. <clears throat> Happy Monday. I believe you should each have a little first five ball cap at your seat. These are part of our um, Community Connections Building Grants, and so uh, we've been giving these out to our funded partners out in the field and uh, have some for you as well. Uh, a couple quick updates. Um, uh, from my executive director's report, you'll see that uh, the First Five Association and First Five California have um, created a relief fund for the county uh, where the fires have been especially impactful. And um, they're collecting money specifically for zero to five efforts in those counties. So if anyone is interested in making donations, I believe they have websites up on, or uh, links up on both of their websites to do that. I also learned that um, uh, CSAC has a county family fire fund as well, so just some of our larger agencies stepping up to help make a difference during this tough time. Um, a couple of bills that were uh, passed recently, signed by the governor, that are specifically zero to five related. Um, we're very excited about the new Parent Leave Act, which um, 
expands the folks who are parents who are eligible for this. It would currently existed for only large employers, and now we have that middle range employers, which really opens it up to um, new uh, a whole new audience of parents. So that's wonderful. And um, our improving kindergarten oral health. Uh, there's some improvements to the data collection side of that. I know Commissioner Jones was uh, very much in favor of this, and so he'll be very excited to hear that too. Sesame Street trauma resources. Last time we talked about the Care, Cope, and Connect toolkit for parents, the little booklet, and we passed that out. They've actually expanded even more on their website, have a lot of different um, trauma-related uh, coloring pages, tips for parents, all kinds of things. So if you get a chance to check out their Sesame, Sesame Street and Communities website, it's a whole new suite of stuff, and it's great. Um, let's see. Our site tour with Assemblymember Cooley has been rescheduled. We thought we were going to get to do that last month, but we are now have December 5th is our date. Um, Commissioner uh, Gordon will join us, as will um, several of their school board trustees will attend that, and we're going to tour one of the um, pre two preschool classrooms and a uh, parent-child interactive play group uh, with the assembly member, just trying a, an extension of our town hall efforts, trying to get our relationships built with our uh, elected officials and get them out on site to our funded programs, let them know what's happening in each of their districts. I have also included in your packet a 2018 long range calendar so you can see the different topics, agenda topics for each month of next year and just a reminder that we don't have an April meeting next year. In communications, you can see our new activity uh, for the month of August, or that might be the month of September, actually. I'm not sure. Seems like August was old data, but it's probably the month of September. <laughs> and um, that is, that's really it. We don't have any exciting videos for you this time. We'll hold off on that till next time. <laughs> okay, great, that thank you. That my report. Okay, any questions for Julie? Uh, excuse me, just one thing on the uh, December 5th uh, site tour. Do you have the times yet? It's usually, usually hard for me to make yeah. it during the day times, but um, or work hours, but nonetheless be useful. Sure, 9.30 in the morning. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, next item please. Advisory committee update. Silva. Good morning to everyone. So I'm not used to being up here so quick, so it seems like it's fast, yeah. So anyway, I'm going to talk a little bit about our 10, 13, 17 meeting, of course. Um, we had a presentation, and I, I think you all know Carolyn Curtis, on um, to our Human Services Coordinating Council, but she discussed it on adverse childhood experiences. Uh, I had suggested she come to the council to talk about it, and try to see what county services, and some of it is already somewhat being implemented within the county. Um, there was a question by one of our members uh, to Walter um, that was asked to Julie, and it was sort of on the spur of the moment, uh, pertaining to the practical aspects of how to present this program. Um, to organizations and agencies to make it sound attractive and something needed. Um, how to put it in place. What would be the process of putting this in place to these agencies? And how to keep the trauma-informed efforts going. You start it, we want to make sure momentum is starting to build right now. We want to say, well, you know, what are some ideas on this? So we bounce that around a little bit. And Julie had shared that there were some specific actions that had taken place at this commit with commission staff here. And she stated she would provide more detailed update at our company meeting. So we're looking very forward to that to see. Um, we approved, of course, our advisory committee meeting schedule for 2018. Uh, for our Julie's report, uh, we talked a little bit about working um, about the uh, RFAs and RFPs, release for applications and proposals. Uh, we were talking. Uh, she was stating that you've been working very diligently to get these out to distribute. We 
you don't want a any gaps in program services and I think that's the key issue right now so we want to get this done of course quickly but we also want to do it and make sure that it's done correctly as well so these these funds get out um, she also had stated that there is mandatory applicant conference scheduled as well uh, for the app and we are actually in the process of an application review panels are being put together for the RFAs and RFPs and then once completed the staff will bring recommendations to the Commission for approval in February and March 2018 so we're looking very forward to that we also have a new staff member with first five uh, Kristen Christina Clinton is our newest member and she was introduced we were happy to have her and first five will share this position with DHHS to work with oral health oral health efforts and we thought that was good that this keep this going uh, birth and beyond presentation by Christina Daniels on the village program through the Valley Hyde Family Resource Center uh, she basically talked about reducing child abuse through a family centered collaborative which you're very probably well aware of at this time uh, we also had Jason Smith continue the presentation with some highlights on services provided by the Village Program through the Resource Center, with its main focus being child abuse and neglect, safe sleep, child prevention, or excuse me, poison in, uh, prevention, and shaken baby syndrome through the Village Program. We found that to be very interesting and we wanted more information on that, uh, with the goal being to engage African American families with children zero through five. We also talked about maybe our advisory board doing a tour. We wanted to actually see it. You know, we hear about all these great programs, but we never get to see them. So one of our meetings, possibly, are going to be a tour through the program and to see the services. I know with Head Start, we have a lot of our programs in that area, and so we would like to collaborate some way as well. Um, we also had something very interesting. We had an advisory member roundtable. I like how that sounds. Uh, we shared topics, but what we did, we all know each other on this board, but a lot of times, and we know our agencies, but we don't know specifically what exactly we do within our organizations. So we shared, we, we each member of the committee provided insight on their representative category or their, their agency, and then we also handed out some information on that too. So that was a very lively conversation. Of course, it took a long time. We scheduled 15 minutes, but when you're talking about other people's organizations, it tends to go a little further but it was a really good conversation and I think it spurred some more presentations down the road too individually about our organizations so that's it so is there any questions any questions for Robert okay. thank you very much thank nice you. to see you all again yeah likewise okay next item please evaluation committee update uh, thank you um, I wanted to uh, thank staff for helping us um, convene a special meeting on November 1st of the Evaluation Committee and um, very pleased to announce that we had a full quorum, a full membership was there. We actually have a new member, I'm not sure if they're fully approved through the through the process, but Jeff uh, Ravinovich uh, joined the committee and we were very pleased to have uh, five members in attendance. Um, and just to quickly review, we um, caught up on all our minutes and housekeeping and we also uh, agreed to our meeting calendar for the year. Um, also, we normally have our evaluation contractors do their reports and uh, applied survey research um, continues to report on their results-based assessment tools. Uh, but also, and I think it's worth noting that um, one of the staff for Applied Research sur uh, Survey Research, Mikhail Newport Barrera, uh, is leaving for another job. And I think it's worth noting that we have found her to be um, very responsive and very competent in her work and in the evaluation efforts. So we're going certainly going to miss her uh, input, but continue to believe that applied research survey research will fit the need well but uh, we wish Mikhail the best uh, LPC gave their report which really focused mainly on the reducing african-american disparities among child deaths um, and, and which is what our major topic of, of the evaluation committee was so we had a very full discussion and review um, with substantial uh, suggestions for improving that draft report that was submitted uh, and we really appreciate that, that opportunity and so you know just some of the suggestions um, we knew this was a draft so we're obviously 
recommending that the executive summary be, uh, or there be a full summary. We also wanted to sort of make sure that these evaluation reports do tie in, especially for this reducing African Americans disparity um, report, um, report, that they tie in together to represent really the, the efforts of both the county, the city, and first five in its overall efforts. And it's a, we were afraid that there's a danger that you just look at any one piece of this, whether it be infant sl safe sleep or whether it be uh, the media campaign, if we don't have a way to sort of frame this conceptually as part of an overall initiative, it sort of undermines the power and the value of, of this um, initiative. Um, we also help define what we think is really the baseline for presenting the data, 2014, um, and we think that one of the limitations in doing yearly uh, evaluation reports is that you tend to look at that year. <laughs> and we always end up with the, the struggle of saying, so what was the results? And the answer is, well, we can't tell until we look at next year. So we've, uh, one, established 2014 as a baseline, and that means that data from 2015 that we've already heard about now has outcome data that can be highlighted, and we really think that's going to be really important. Um, we agreed to go forward with the draft um, with these edits to ensure that, um, um, that we keep to our timeline and that there would be further review by the committee. Um, so that's the essence of our report. Very productive meeting and we, as always we value the incredible work of uh, Carmen and, and uh, the, the team at First Five and our evaluators. So thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next item please. Financial Planning Committee update. We met on October 5th and um, staff reported they've been working on the approval of an online Medi-Cal administrative activities training developed by CAPSI, and the course content is currently submitted to the local government agency for approval. Then it will go to the state for final approval. Once it's approved, it will allow new staff to train on the Medi-Cal Medi -Cal administrative activities sooner and increase the amount of funding claimable. A draft audit report was provided to the committee from the Independent County Auditors, VDT. There were no audit findings and the final audit is expected to be submitted on time. Proposition 10 funding is being monitored closely to watch for any anomalies created by the pa pro passage of Proposition 56 and the first three months of the fiscal year have all been within budgeted projections. And the financial statements through August 31 were reviewed and no questions went unanswered. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, the next item is a report back from our sustainability chair who is not here. So I suspect we'll get that at the next, sure. next commission meeting. We didn't actually meet, uh, but um, what they did approve online was the policy platform, which is later on in the agenda. Sure. Okay, and then item number eight is a presentation from our executive director, correct? From our uh, partners. I guess so. Um, I'd like to invite Nancy Hirota and Natalie Woods Andrews. They will be giving a presentation on the currently funded program called Project SOARS and talking about um, their plans and the leadership team's plans to morph Project SOARS into Help Me Grow, which will launch later next year. Great. Welcome. Good afternoon. My afternoon. name is Nancy Hirota, and I am the Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services at the Sacramento County Office of Education. And we're just very pleased to be here today to share with you highlights of Project SOARS. In our last presentation to the Commission, we provided updates about the initial pilot. And today, I'm here to share with you highlights of the impact of Project SOARS in the last two years as we have embarked upon this work after the initial pilot. And then Dr. Natalie Woods Andrews will be sharing with you information about a new initiative that we will be expanding upon through Project SOARS. 
The goal of Project SOARS is to reach out to families who are typically underserved because they live in isolated communities. And we accomplish our work by working very closely with transitional housing programs, with homeless shelters, with domestic violence shelters, and working with other agencies that refer families to Project SOARS. One of our approaches is to conduct education, outreach, and training. And we do this by conducting presentations for not only families, but also to pediatricians, CPS social workers, foster agencies, and a number of partners in the community to share highlights of early intervention and special education services that are available for children from infancy through age five. But most importantly, it providing information about how to support families to access these services. The focus of our work, the primary bulk of our work, does focus on providing direct family support. And we accomplish this through three family advocates who work very closely with families out in the community. They conduct home visits and they work very closely with families to develop action plans that are individualized to meet the needs of each family. Through Project SOARS, we conduct free and voluntary developmental screenings using the Ages and Stages questionnaire as well as the Ages and Stages questionnaire focusing on social emotional development. And we also conduct vision and hearing screenings. Our family advocates, they bring the audiometers and the vision screening tools to the home so that they can conduct these, these screenings. But the most important component of our work has to do with the follow-up that our family advocates provide in terms of any concerns that are identified through these screenings, and I'll share some data about that in just a minute. But I am very delighted to share with you that Project SOARS is the recipient of the 2017 Golden Bell Award from the California School Boards Association. We just received this news um, in this past week, and this is an award that will, there will be a recognition event on November 30th in San Diego at the California School Boards Association Conference. So we're looking forward to that, and it is quite an honor. I know there were over 200 uh, applications that were sub submitted and it's I think less than 30 that were selected so we were very pleased. This slide provides an overview of the extensive partnerships that we have been able to establish throughout the community to serve children and families, and, and typically the most vulnerable children and families given the agencies that we're working very closely with. In the past two years, since 2015, we have expanded our partnerships. In the p initial pilot, we were partnering at a, with agencies serving families at about 20 sites. And as you can see, we are now we're reaching families at 40 different sites throughout Sacramento County. Some of our new partnerships include partnerships with the Sacramento Crisis Nursery. We also, <clears throat> excuse me, recently began working with Mustard Seed, the WIC program operated by the county. We also are working very closely with a Community for Peace, Mary House, as well as a number of agencies that are identified here. The key to the success of Project SOARS is the close collaboration in working with staffs at each of these agencies. We've worked out a very seamless referral process so that as, fam as these agency staff identify children who could benefit from these developmental screenings, they make a referral to Project SOARS, but it's really a warm handoff where the, fam the staff are referring families, introducing them to our support staff, our family advocates, so that we're really seen as an extension of these agencies and families have been very receptive to our services because of that approach. This slide summarizes the impact of our work in the last two years. We have implemented a very uh, extensive evaluation tool so that we can track and I'm pleased to say that we have met or exceeded all of our milestones in our contract. As you can see, over the last two years, we have conducted over 1,700 home visits, our three family advocates, 624 ASQ developmental screenings, as well as 342 ASQ, the social-emotional screening, 
we've added, as I was sharing with you, the vision and hearing screening. So in the last two years, we've conducted 231 vision and hearing screenings, developed 244 action plans, which have resulted in 166 developmental referrals in the areas of both not only children's development, but concerns about children's social emotional development or health. And then we also were able to refer families to 558 different types of referrals, which I will highlight in just a minute. The one piece, on, well, the piece of information that I wanted to expand upon on in this slide has to do with the developmental referrals, the concerns about children's social emotional development, developmental delays, or health concerns. Of those 166 referrals, 72% is, is, the, is the percentage of families who either accessed assessment services or they were referred to another agency for further follow-up or follow-up regarding these assessments are currently taking place. So it's given the transient population that we are working with, we are, <clears throat> we are we're very pleased with the success in terms of assisting families to access these services. And I have to tell you, the key to the success has to do with the work of our family advocates who work very closely with families, preparing them for these various appointments for assessments, explaining the process, explaining the type of assessments that their child will be going through, and assisting them in preparing for IEP meetings, or in many cases, being there at the IEP, IEP meetings to help explain things to families and, and really help them to advocate for themselves. And as a result of their extensive support, we just are very pleased with the outcome and what we know, and you'll hear, have a chance to hear from one of our family advocates, mm -hmm. what we have learned over the last three, three and a half years of piloting this program is that without Project SOARS, families would not have information about these services. Time and time again, families have identified or have shared that they didn't believe or didn't know that children could access services before kindergarten. So the fact that we're connecting them to Alta Regional Center, SCOE's Infant Development Program, or districts for services for children three to five, this has had a tremendous impact in terms of serving children and helping them access these services. This next slide um, is a slide that breaks down the various services that I just shared with you by agency. And as you can see, the two largest agencies that we are currently working with, one is Volunteers of America that has four different sites throughout Sacramento County. The second largest agency we're working with is Next Move with three sites. But across the board, you can see that we have developed strong partnerships with all of our agencies. And as referrals come in, our family advocates are right there to provide that support. This slide highlights the types of comprehensive services or referrals for comprehensive services that our family advocates provide. So not only do our family advocates support families to access services around developmental concerns, but when they're in the home working with families, they are identifying other needs. And as a result, you can see the variety of referrals Early Head Start is one of our largest referrals right after developmental concerns. And through Early Head Start, families are able to receive weekly home visits. So it's yet another warm handoff to another agency that can continue to work with the family and provide that ongoing support. The Family Resource Centers, operated by the Child Abuse Prevention Council, they have been key resources in terms of helping to meet the needs of the families that we are working with. And again, Project Source has served as that liaison to connect families to these agencies. Before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Natalie Woods-Andrews, let me just expand a bit upon the outreach sessions, the informational sessions that we've been conducting. I shared with you a, a big a component of our work has been to conduct these presentations. And through these presentations for pediatricians, for CHDP providers, again for social workers at both CPS and foster agencies, these have been not only important but extremely valuable opportunities to share information with providers who may not have known about 
the level of services that are available, and most importantly, how to access these services. So we're really excited about this opportunity to be able to expand upon this community outreach, and we plan to accomplish that through the new Help Me Grow initiative, which Natalie will be sharing with you. Thank you so much. It is indeed just a pleasure to stand before you again to share a little bit more in terms of where we're moving in um, Sacramento County for Help Me Grow. Project SOARS has truly positioned us to take that next step in the work that we feel is best for Sacramento County's young children and families. And so we are just delighted again to partner with First Five Sacramento to move this work together at a higher level. Help Me Grow is a model that truly is focused on early identification as well as early intervention to really link families to appropriate services that would support their young child's development. So our goal really is to help children grow, help them develop develop, help them thrive to their highest level of potential. And that's what Help Me Grow is about. It's not a system that is a standalone program, but it truly does build upon systems that are already in place. So we're looking at Help Me Grow as a way of really developing a comprehensive set of uh, supports and approaches for children and families. We're also looking at our goal in terms of successful implementation would be that we just continue to leverage the resources that are available for us here in Sacramento County, really maximizing those resources and those existing opportunities. There are so many agencies and programs and community assets that are focused on supporting young children, but they're not always coordinated. And so this is our opportunity to really create a comprehensive, coherent, coordinated system of support for our children and families. And we'll do this through a coalition <coughs> of collaborative partners all focused on this same vision. And you'll hear just a little bit about that in a moment. On this map that is before you, you will see that Help Me Grow is part of a national movement. California is part of this movement, and there are several different counties that are now a part of this movement, positioning their communities to really support their children and families. And so you'll see on this slide in the green, Sacramento is one of 20 counties that is currently implementing or is positioned to implement Help Me Grow or early identification services in a coordinated way. In the orange, you'll see that there are about 21 other counties that are in the planning phases of positioning themselves. They have some components in place that they are putting, pulling together so that they can, again, build up on those systems. And then there are 17 counties in the gray area that have not yet identified themselves as planning nor implementing, but I think are really in those initial stages of thinking about what it is that they will do to help support their children and families. The focus of Help Me Grow truly is to promote wide use of developmental screenings to help detect any type of developmental delay or any type of behavioral delay that a child may have. But not only identify it, but to successfully link those families to services and then follow up with them to make sure that they're accessing the services that are available to them in the community. Foundational to the Help Me Grow model are four interdependent components that are identified on this particular slide. The first has to do with child health care provider outreach. The Help Me Grow um, components really does help the family and service providers commit to making sure that our families have a, a medical home and making sure that we're building that awareness with pediatricians and healthcare providers in terms of the importance of early identification, early um, access to services. Oftentimes we hear, let's wait, you know, children will grow out of it. But we know we can't wait. Those first five years are critical. And so this provides us with an opportunity to position ourselves to 
to have greater outreach in our medical community to help build that awareness of the importance of early identification early on. The second component has to do with family and community outreach. Of course, we want to build that awareness with our family that there are resources and supports that are available, and we want to help them navigate the system in terms of accessing those services. At the same time, we do need to build that awareness within our community. This is a little shift for our community in terms of how we'll move forward with Help Me Grow. Everyone is, is used to working many times in isolation. This gives us an opportunity to break down some of those silos and come together to support children and families in a more comprehensive and coherent way. The third component is a centralized access point, and I'm very excited about this piece because this is a piece that we will begin with our initial work, and it is creating a one-stop shop, if you will, an opportunity for us to have a centralized call center where we can have those who are providing developmental screenings or behavioral screenings can access a centralized area that can then do that triage and point families into the direction of accessing those services as well as providing the technical assistance and support and the follow-up. And so we will move forward in a coordinated way with a centralized access point in Sacramento. I know that when I've mentioned this to many providers who are currently conducting developmental screenings and then they kind of scramble to find, okay, now where can I, I where can I refer this family? They're on their own trying to call different locations to help access those services. And so when I've mentioned that we're moving towards this Help Me Grow model where there's a centralized access point, I hear them exhale. Like, oh, there's a coordinated way to do this work. And I think we will just use our resources much more wisely with one access point, really knowing where those families are and being able to follow up. The fourth component has to do with that data collection. And because we're part of a national model, there's already evaluation systems in place. We will just have to make sure that we're positioned to collect that data through a system that we have designed here locally so that we can make sure we're feeding all of our data into not only the state but the national data system. This provides us with an opportunity to really look at what the gaps are in our community and really help improve our systems while we're making sure we're addressing those gaps. This particular slide shares with you some of the key collaborative partners who have been at the table along this journey as we have been developing this Help Me Grow model for Sacramento County. And while they have come to the table to assist with the development of the application to become an affiliate to access greater supports and services, we just met with them last week and they are all in. And in fact, I think it's more of who else can we bring to the table. So I think this leadership team will continue to grow, our collaborative efforts throughout the community will continue to grow as we move forward. We are going to begin with a subcontract as we have in the past with Project SOARS, but this will be focused on Help Me Grow as we transition into this model. We will be contracting with Warmline Family Resource Center, and you've heard a lot about their services, but they are very well positioned to serve as that centralized access point for Sacramento County. So we're very excited to move forward with Warmline as a key partner in this work. They will work with us very collaboratively to disseminate information about the Help Me Grow call center, also helping to provide that information to families and the community about the developmental milestones, also making sure that we're providing information on how families can act services to really get what they need for their children and families for intervention, but then also to create that greater outreach into our community. As I mentioned, this is a little shift for Sacramento County, so we're going to have to do broad outreach not only to those who are providing services and support to children and families, but also to our medical community. That's going to be huge for us in Sacramento County. So moving forward in this upcoming year, we will pilot 
and expand upon the work of Project SOAR. So what has come to the commission, I want to say a month ago or so, was approval for the Help Me Grow model. It wasn't so much for Project SOARS, but Help Me Grow will serve as the umbrella. The work of Project SOARS will be embedded within the Help Me Grow model as we move forward. So we will pilot this year with that partnership with Warmline Family Resource Center as that centralized call center. That's going to be critical for us to get that up and running for Sacramento County. And so we will be conducting great outreach, not to only to our greater community, but also with our health care providers. We've already been in conversation with Yolo County that is already moving forward with Help Me Grow. We met with them last Friday to just get some lessons learned in terms of how they're moving forward. We're planning a visit with our team here at First Five to Alameda County to take a look at how they are currently implementing Help Me Grow so that, again, we're not walking along this journey alone, but we are really building up on the common knowledge of others implementing this work and who have gone on this journey before us. And then in the new funding cycle, 2018-2020, our goal is to fully implement all four components of the Help Me Grow model. So very excited to be able to share as we move forward how we're progressing with this particular model for Sacramento County. And so at the bottom of this slide, you know, it says together we can create a future of better outcomes for our children who may be at risk or at promise. And so this work does not just happen with Sacramento County Office of Education, not just with First Five, but just a number of key partners here in our community. So I'm just very excited to introduce to you a couple of members who are part of our team or who have been a part of this work to share a little testimony in terms of the impact of Project SOARS as we're moving into Help Me Grow. And so I'd like to introduce Kia Williams, who's a social worker with Salvation Army Transitional Housing. And Kia, I tell you, has been instrumental in the success of Project SOARS moving forward. This is a go-getter. She is on her game when it comes to connecting with families and making sure that they're accessing the resources that are available to them. And then following Kia, we have one of our family advocates from the Sacramento County Office of Education, Kirsten Morrell, who will share with you a little bit more of her role as a family advocate in this work. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you guys for letting me speak here today about the SOARS program. I've been with Salvation Army for almost six years. I have collaborated with SOARS program for three and a half years. They offer a wide variety of services here, like the free developmental screening, which is great because a lot of the children will or may fall through the cracks when it comes to school. I want to talk about uh, a child. This little boy had no speech, no communication with his parents, and we referred him to Kirsten, which is one of the source outreach workers. And he got into Early Head Start, and he got speech therapy, and now he's talking, which is Awesome. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> All right, don't be nervous. <laughs> what I love about this program is the patience and the care the ladies bring to the clients with meeting with them. They take the time to listen to the families. They hold hands. They sit with them when they have appointments or meetings. I think their model should be whatever it takes because that's exactly what the ladies here do. Thank you guys so Great. much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kirsten Morrell, and I'm a family advocate with Project SOARS. I've been an advocate since the beginning, 2014, and I just wanted to talk to you about some of the outcomes that we've achieved. Um, from the beginning, the families were very receptive to us. They welcomed us into their home, which um, began screenings right away. One of the first screenings I did was at Mather Community Campus and I was um, introduced to a mother that had an 18 month old child who wasn't walking and we went to screen the child and we could see that she was having some kind of um, 
like her muscles weren't developed very well in her legs. So we did the referral to um, SCOE's infant development program. And they came out and did an assessment and the child qualified for um, occupational therapy. So within six months, the child went from scooting um, to walking. So um, I'm still in touch with that family today and the child is now in kindergarten and running and playing with her friends. And so um, it's nice to see um, a little girl that's just happy and developing like she should be. Um, shortly after that, I was referred to a family at Cerna Village, and this child was two and she was not speaking. So um, we did a referral to Alta Regional, and um, they came out and did an assessment and provided speech services for the child. Um, but in addition to that, I was concerned because the family didn't have medical insurance, so I was able to work with the family, get her insurance. Um, we made an appointment with a pediatrician, and from there we made another appointment appointment, a couple other appointments, because I just felt that something else was missing. Um, and as a result of working with this family and connecting her to pediatricians, it turns out that the child was had significant hearing loss. Um, so we were able to get the child a hearing aid, and I just, I don't know if this is appropriate, but the school district missed that with their um, hearing. So um, I feel fortunate that we kind of kept going and going and were able to provide um, that support that otherwise that child may not have received until later. Um, so since then we've had multiple success stories. Um, most recently um, Kia did a referral to me and last spring I was connected with a mom who had two kids under five and was also pregnant. We did screenings on her children and both of them were um, showing potential scores for referrals. The four-year-old we referred to um, San Juan Unified School District and we were able to um, provide through that referral provide speech services for her as well as get her enrolled in a Head Start program in her community. Her two-year-old was referred to SCOE's infant development program and he qualified for speech and occupational therapy as well. And he also um, is part of Early Head Start now. So as you can see, um, we are receiving families consistently and screening families consistently, which otherwise wouldn't have been connected with um, resources. And what the families do say is they, they didn't know, you know, they think there's something wrong, but they don't know where to go. And when they ask for help, um, they're not always given the right information. Um, so I just want to end by saying I'm very appreciative for this opportunity to work with SCOE and First Five and be out in the community helping families. Um, and the, our partnerships that we have are um, amazing. Gabby is here with um, the Sacramento Food Bank and she, um, I can call her anytime if I have a family that needs anything. She always tells me to come on down and I've been able to provide families that are displaced for multiple reasons, um, they, they don't have clothes for their children. They don't have um, just basic necessities that I'm able to provide that for them. So um, if it weren't for them, um, their assistance for me just helps in providing more positive outcomes for my families. So. Thank you. Okay.
Just one last piece of information to share about Kirsten's work. She has been with Project Source since 2014, and one of the sites that she has worked with over the years has, is at Cerna Village, and she shared with you some of the significant delays that they are able to identify and access the services. And just at Cerna Village alone, she helped families Five children just at that site alone were diagnosed with autism and are now receiving services, so we've been able to coordinate some additional support at that site with Warmline, where they're working directly with families because this is such a, a recent diagnosis and providing that network of support. So I can't say enough about Kirsten's as well as all of our other family advocates, their commitment to this work. What I'd like to do at this point is to have our collaborative, our collaborative partner stand. We have a number of our partners here in the audience. So if I could have everyone stand. So we have partners from not only the Sacramento Food Bank, but our county department of DHHS Behavioral Health. Public Health is here. We also have Volunteers of America and Alta Regional. So again, the success of this model has been based on these very successful collaborative partnerships. So we thank everyone for being a part of this exciting work. So thank at you this very much. Point, thank you. Commissioner Wirtz. Yes, thank you for the opportunity. I just have to say, I'm as a developmental psychologist, I'm um, truly su supportive of this and, and really value it. And I just wanted to highlight the issue around equity. Um, equity, in large part, means uh, getting access to similar opportunity. Um, and I think what you have done with this sort of intense and specific outreach to both health care professionals as well as families begins to address that gap in social capital and in uh, the ability to have access to the same opportunities that, that others have that have those resources. So I think this is really not only a great program for, um, for development in general and the need for this early identification and early access to intervention, but it also addresses one of our fundamental principles about equity and and addressing um, unequal opportunity and disparities. So thank you so much. Commissioner Lake. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you all for the work that you do. Uh, you know, after three decades of doing this uh, kind of work, I've become a firm believer in the butterfly effect. And the small things that you do with these families on a day-to-day -day basis changes their lives and can change the course of our world. So God bless you all. Thank you. Commissioner Moak. Um, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. Um, obviously, Dr. Hirota and Andrews, um, what you guys have continued to do and commit yourselves to doing in this community is nothing short of spectacular, so thank you. And you definitely have rock stars behind you having had the chance to work with Kia on a various set of projects. She, I know that she's amazing, and Kirsten, I can only imagine um, hearing those stories is great. Um, I want to just real quick, the thing, I know that the school missing the test um, could be spun and seen as a, as a negative. I, I tend to look at those things as incredibly positive, that you are able to, that's, that's why the system is in some cases set up the way it is, so that you are able to, to be there as a, as a second wave of support for that family um, and to think what would have happened had you not been there to catch that and where we'd be today. So I tend to see those things. Um, as positive. The only, uh, just a quick mechanical question, just asking nothing against YOLO. They produce fantastic people. Um, <laughs> and we've taken a, a lot from them. Uh, but the, I saw the YOLO Family Service Agency, which I know and have a, a great relationship with myself, but what, how, their role, obviously an out of county partner, just, just how, does that, how does that work with, with us here? You know, when we first uh, pulled together the Sacramento County leadership for Help Me Grow, Julie, with her advocacy role in promoting Help Me Grow in Yellow County, suggested that we invite hmm. the, our Yellow County partners so that we could learn. They were still in a, the fairly, uh, it was still fairly new in their county, and given that we were in the initial planning, it's, it was just so valuable to have uh, our Yellow County partner at the table. 
and well, chicken tenders. I don't think it'll be an ongoing partnership, but we just didn't want to have to reinvent the wheel. So we're Great. actually doing an Alameda County trip to check out their Help Me Grow site and um, just want to learn from what everyone else is already doing. So we have such a, I wanted to say, such a good start through Project Source. We were at the perfect position to just take it to the next step and do more of a countywide system with the um, with the one access call center, which is which is really the only thing that Project Source didn't because you right. they were already doing community outreach. You could see from the partnerships mm -hmm. they were already reaching providers, medical providers, Kaiser. Uh, working with CHDP providers here in the county. So it really is sort of taking it to the next level with the call center and then um, upping our data game a little bit and um, following what the national uh, data requirements are, which will help us show uh, the big picture and be able to drill all the way down to Sacramento County. So I'm just so excited about this project. Cool. Thank you. Commissioner Kozik. Wonderful work, wonderful work. I had two quick questions. Um, I've forgotten the first five investment funding amount for, for the project, and I wondered in the call center concept, is there another funding source or multiple funding sources? Okay, so our three-year investment for the current strategic plan period, so through 20, June uh, 30 of 20. 18 is $765,000 um, for all three years combined. And then um, that that is actually increasing slightly in our next three-year plan as we morph it from uh, source into Help Me Grow. That will be a $1.2 million contract over those three years. Did I get both of your questions or? Is there any um County Office of Education funding complementing it? In terms of our partnership, we do have in-kind support through the County Office. Our Infant Development Program provides in-kind support, and then our Early Learning Department also provides in-kind support to support these efforts. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Turner Johnson. Well, this is very heartwarming to hear. In emulating the comprehensive family service model, you're picking up parts of the population, children and families, that otherwise just wouldn't get this. And, and in relation to the comments my fellow Commissioner Moak made, I think that you know not every agency can be comprehensive. That, that isn't necessarily uh, what they're uh, funding allows and and the kind of detail that we get into and in the testing at home visiting for goodness sake so what you're doing is just remarkable because um, we just uh, fully appreciate that these other children, you know, are going to get served in a way that is life changing. I just have one question, and and if you mentioned this and I missed it, I apologize up front. But on the summary of services, uh, that I think it's slide number four, we are you're showing the overall uh, categories of services through two five. 2015, 16, then 16, 17. Overall, there's just a very, very slight dec um, increase, but in some of the uh, categories, there was, you know, a more significant decrease, like home visits and developmental screenings, and then action plans, of course. And uh, the ASQSE went up, but other went down. My question, I'm, I'm surmising something. I'm surmising that it might be because in the first year, you kind of identified in the age span you're serving a lot of the need, and then in the second year, you were continuing the work, but not necessarily for that age span. I doubt that you met all the need, but why would there be a decrease in some of those areas? I'm curious, that's all. Well, I know the increase in the social emotional, the eight ages and stages social emotional that went up, initially we were identifying concerns if a parent expressed concern. In the second year, we made a decision to screen all children using both the developmental oh, that's and so interesting. using the SC, the social emotional component as well. So that explains the increase. Um, I'm looking here at some of the decreases. And maybe Kristen can. I mean, just from the, 
just from the top, I mean, you're you're clipping at 150 or so less home visits from year yeah. one to year two. I mean, it's not massive. I'm just curious why. It may. Ha I keep thinking that because you identified a group the first year, but I'm not sure what the reason is. I was just curious. And it really depends on the family composition as well, because if there is a family that have multiple children under five, we're still just counting one home visit. So right. the number, if the number of referrals, as you can see, and especially with the ASQSC, it did go up. So I think it will vary from year to year, depending, especially the number of home visits, because it's we count home visits, not the number of children per visit. So I think as we progress from year to year, we'll see these fluctuations, and we have a very intensive, extensive evaluation component, so I think we'll definitely be able to paint a bigger picture over time as we continue to gather this data. Yeah, all right, thank you. Commissioner Wirtz. Uh, thank you. Just a follow-up question, but uh, just a comment on that. Um, it might help if you were to ID the number of families and the number of children that were served, just as, um, you know, sort of unique number of families, unique number of children. That mm -hmm. would be helpful, I think. The, my question was more about the overall Help Me Grow um, model. Is there not any national or state funding for Help Me Grow. I, I had the impression, probably incorrectly, uh, that we were applying for a Help Me Grow funding grant, but maybe it was just TA and other things? So, so. It's, it was primarily technical assistance, uh, a learning community that they put together, sharing of um, everything from job descriptions to staffing plans to scripts for um, the phone service. So a lot of the things that have been created and used in other counties, they, they've sort of created a learning model, a, a learning community for that that we will be a part of. There's no actual money coming in for it right now, um, but there is a lot of talk about Help Me Grow, both nationally and in the state, and we, we really want to be aligned, to align ourselves so that if this does become the next big thing and there's funding attached to it, that we are a partner, we're in place, and we're ready to receive any such funding. <laughs> Um, it, it is interesting to look at these kind of um, support services. I mean, they're, they're a model that comes from maybe limited funding, but, but there's a lot to be offered around learning community and technical resources and, and so on. So it'd be very interesting to see how well you feel supported by that uh, model and by their TA. So um, useful to track. We'll let you know. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, I'll certainly join my uh, colleagues in uh, giving um, uh, warm accolades to uh, all, the, all of the people that uh, made uh, your success what it is and uh, we continue to wish you well and uh, your endeavors to to do what you're doing for our community so thank you very much okay next item please approve the 2018 first five Sacramento policy platform okay you have included in your packet a draft of our updated policy platform for 2018. Um, you may recall that the uh, Sustainability Committee drafted the first version of this uh, for you in 2017, or 2016 for 2017. And with the changes in our strategic plan and looking ahead to 2018-19, we made some modifications to the plan to really follow, our, or to the, uh, policy platform to really follow our strategic plan direction. So a couple of things have changed, which I will uh, go over with you. Under the health, um, health heading, we included uh, in the first bullet point the word health and dental services. So increased access to and utilization of health and dental services for young children and pregnant women. Um, and then we actually removed the um, childhood obesity uh, bullet item because in the new strategic plan, we're not gonna be focusing on childhood obesity prevention. Um, and under uh, systems change and sustainability, we added a bullet to address um, the 
work we're doing around adverse childhood experiences, so you can read that one, support systems that lessen the impact of adverse childhood experiences and build resiliency through trauma-informed approaches. Um, so this is a draft version. We didn't actually get a chance to meet um, in person with our sustainability committee last month, um, but they did take a look at it. Um, but we are very much open to uh, conversation today. Commissioner Wirtz has um, thrown a few questions out to us prior um, that I'm happy to address, or if you want to, however you'd like to do that, we can, we can walk through them if you'd like. Okay. Okay, any questions of Julie? If not, you want to uh, take up the questions then uh, provided by uh, Mr. Wirtz? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, and thank you for giving us this in advance. It was, uh, I had a little chance to review it and th think about it. And th my first comment is I think that the sustainability sustainability committee is doing a super job of looking at this and so these are simply suggestions and I think um, both uh, the level of discussion on it is supposed to be higher level policy so um, my first comment was about the health one um, and whether these three areas help cover the the question of uh, potential funding gaps around the ACA uh, changes and and I think they're probably broad enough that they do um, and I leave that to the sustainability committee um, under empowered families um, there's um, the increased social capital by supporting family connections is probably broad enough, but um, it, it refers to community resources, and I think um, the Black Legacy and other community efforts demonstrate the value of engaging communities in joint efforts to support families and children um, in, a, in a more um, grassroots or grounded uh, community-based efforts. So if that's included in social capital, it could be by supporting family connections to community resources um, and engaging communities in the efforts or, you know, just to be clear that that's um, included in that. And I really like that the uh, ACE, uh, going to the systems change piece, I really like that the ACEs piece was added there. I think there's a lot to be learned about um, services and systems and, and uh, organizations about how they can uh, reduce trauma and build uh, resilience. So the, uh, my language change there was simply to add after support systems, add policies and programs there to, um, to expand that a little bit. And, and then finally, um, and we talked about this uh, a little bit, one of the big problems we have with uh, siloed funding is the, uh, is the constraints that and barriers that that creates um, for at the program level for integrating services and um, you know can this person who's being funded by uh, by this program do the screening for uh, to include the screening for some other service or something so the issue of um, integrating funding streams or services um, like through blending and uh, braiding of funding you know or or through making the uh, reporting requirements. Um, more integrated, um, both at our level here with our own funding and our own county programs, but potentially for the sustainability committee to look at both state and national. I know we don't have influence over those, but we have a voice, um, and it may help. I know I'm getting requests from around the opioid issue from the White House Policy Group, from the new commission, from SAMHSA, from CDC, about what recommendations to make to the feds, and we're we're making recommendations about saying, well, why doesn't CDC talk to SAMHSA and agree to the same data items or, or whatever, you know? So I'm not sure if there's a way to address that issue of trying to streamline funding streams to better enable programs to serve in a comprehensive, integrated, whole person way. Um, yeah, that is. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> that is large. That is large. Because um, you mentioned like what we can do locally, I think is on a different level than what we might, any sort of Im influence to be larger than us. But one of the examples you and I talked about before the meeting was um, just with our Birth and Beyond program, how we have sort of separate reporting requirements for zero to five, and then they, they took on six plus, and so 
Uh, we have two reports, uh, two different ways of looking at the data, so we now have a small work group where we're trying to streamline that data, be collecting the same thing across all the populations so we can tell a full story about what Birth and Beyond data is, uh, is showing with its impact. So I do think we're doing some of that. I, we were we we're looking at it almost more as like a strategy for how to um, help our programs leverage and um, collaborate and work together, not only with us but with each other. Um, so there is some language about about this in our um, system sustainability plan and in the the work the operational work plan of it about. Um, uh, what does it even mean to, to leverage, to braid, to blend, and how are we, what's our definition going to, uh, how are we defining it? So when we ask our, can, our contractors to talk to us about it, we're all using the same language and things like that. So um, I do think we're addressing it. It's just not really specifically called out here, which we can if, if you all think it's important enough to do that. Um, where it is more called out, um, it's already in our RFPs and our RFAs. It's going to be in our contract language as requirement, and it is in our system sustainability plan. It's just not on this document, but we could. Um, I do agree. I think um, th with your under the systems change, the support systems policies and programs that lessen the impact. I think that's great. We, we were missing those two words, and I really like that. Um, and then I would. And then I would agree that um, we call out the ACA uh, just around breastfeeding, but kind of our first bullet under health, we wanted to leave it fairly broad. It could incorporate ACA. It doesn't specifically call it out, but we figure it's access to health and dental, and that covers every kind of situation. Um, so I jumped all over the place in responding to you. But um, I guess I would if the commissioners have a, any particular um, direction on it, and we would, that would, I'm thinking we'd have to add a 13th bullet to the end of this around well, that, or yeah, I'm not sure. Let me just maybe f first respond if that's okay. I think, you know, if you, if sustainability committee uh, reads support legislation that protects the well-being of children in the broadest terms, that could also look at funding streams and integration and so on. So I think it's more just bringing it to the attention um, of the sustainability committee, which I think has done a super job already uh, in addressing this. And, and I, I think, you know, it might be easy enough to put in the policies and programs piece, but I think the other thoughts are more, the, the only other one is trying to strengthen the language around how we would engage communities, mm -hmm. uh, community leaders, maybe spelling out what resources means just a little bit more, but again, resources could cover everything. So um, I leave it in the great hands of the uh, Sustainability Committee. Okay. Commissioner Moak. And just making sure that I, I, understand this and I some of this I think is maybe unlearning what I have traditionally called a policy platform I think mm -hmm. which is to me at least in my history would be legislation like you're focused on like your policy platform your policy agenda your policy document is all around the things you're going to push for right in champion or all around our policy process right our and so the legislative process this is different, is. I think, is what you're, what I am hearing and feeling, which I think is good. My original thought was like, the support legislation that protects the well-being of children would be your header <laughs> statement that, you know, right. increases access to. You could literally start every sentence with that, is how I, I saw it. Right. But, so I, I do want to just make sure that when we're calling it a policy platform, that we are knowing it isn't just that. Right? I mean, it's. You make a great point. And so, how this evolved is that during the strategic planning process, we had several. Remember, we, we narrowed it down from 21 different result areas mm -hmm. down to our 10 or 12 that we have. And it was, it was challenging for the, for the committee to just take things off 
entirely. And so we said, well, let's deal with that through policy. Let's, let's, let's do that through policy. So our policy agenda or our policy work got increased as our direct service funding got decreased. Uh -huh. And so things could have came off direct services and into the we should pay attention to this, but just in a different way. So some of the ways that we pay attention to it are internally in our own operations, things that we, uh, policies we can do internally around um, ACEs and others. And then some of it is actually having a voice, taking opinions on legislation and things like that. So this is more so than just legislation. These are things that we can do internally and have an external voice on around around these specific topics that are within our strategic plan if that makes sense yeah yeah it does <laughs> yeah <laughs> i just don't that's just a it's like yeah <laughs> uncomfortable for me or something yeah. like but if but if look if you know what you're what you want to use it for and it's not confusing anyone else and that it can be clear for in, in its intent and purpose i i would just also the increase access one and then the increase social capital those are the two uh, I guess expanding access to those are those are very active um, kind of bullets um, versus support right support and then the supporting is much looser yes. you get, yeah, anyone can kind of support things it, increasing it changes to me the tenor the tone of it um, so if that is in fact you know it reminds me a little bit of the old declaring the war on drugs or the war on terror or whatever it is right you when you make that declaration like all of a sudden you got to do something about it so if you are saying that our through our pol 2018 policy platform is that we're going to increase access to this or increase social capital by this then we got to do it we don't just get to say it right right we got to then do it and then i would get into how are we doing that right, right? and then it starts to unfold from there so if it's support though yeah. Well, we garnered these three new legislators, we added these three new programs, we wrote 4,000 letters, we whatever, right? Th then we yep. supported it. Check. Yep. We did it. Yep. So anyway. That's so we might want to consider under health that first one that we have an increase. This is one where we are not going to be directly funding our access anymore. So we may want to change that to a support. I feel like we, we can legitimately keep our increased social access, social uh, capital and building family support because we actually are funding this, we're investing in it, and we have people on the boots on the ground doing that work. So um, that's a good point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Commissioner Elliott. As the sole representative of the yes. sustainability <laughs> committee, um, I, all of these comments are right in line. I mean, I think they, it makes sense, and I agree. Uh, changing at the top their support access to makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the, there are some very broad statements, so that we can take a lot of action um, in a variety of ways. Uh, so that was purposeful, but. Um, Again, I'm open to everything that's been suggested, and this is going to change over time since this is a new effort anyways. You know, what this looks like this year, it probably will look very different next year and will become more sophisticated in actually how we implement and, and what we say, too, a little bit more strategic as we realize what our strategy should be. Um, and, you know, that will come with increased relationships at the state capitol and the counties and our partners. So um, I, I, I just want to say that it, you know, I, if the commission would like to make those changes that have been suggested, I think that those make a lot of sense, and I would, I, I know Donna and, and Terry would would agree. So, so yeah. And Commissioner Wirtz, um, I'm wondering what, whether there was uh, an intent to act on this for the commission today, or whether it would make sense to have these be suggestions that come back to the uh, Sustainability Committee for final uh, finalization prior to. Going to recommend that because there are, there are more than just it's a little bit more than just a, adding a word or right. changing this, but. Um, I think it would be great for the committee to get it back with all the feedback from today and have opportunity to look at it, make some changes, and then we could possibly bring it back at the December uh, yeah. meeting. That would make sense to me, okay. um, but I can't make the motion. But um, the other thing I guess I would 
clarify with my perception, Scott, uh, around policy is that, you know, the jargon is big P, little P, um, and um, a lot can be done with little P, um, you know, where agency changes their policies, their procedures, and so on, and, and I think that's the intent there, that even systems can change their policy without legislative um, kind of efforts. Uh, MOUs can be put in place, um, you know, a variety of ways to make, I think, very critical, um, integrative and, and, and um, uh, changes it for the better. So I, th I think it's really important to keep the, the concept clear that the not, we have limited access to legislation and we have limited access to organizations, but nonetheless, both of those are avenues for uh, what we might call policy change. The other thing about the words increase and support, I'm seeing that one of the things that the Sustainability Committee had done is start to actually work through advocacy. Uh, and not so much with legislation, but that also. But, but so, so advocacy, advocate for increases in, mm -hmm. is another way to think about this language because one, that doesn't require the same level of funding and, I th you know, and we've talked about that before. Yeah. So that's my other suggestion. I like that. Commissioner Elliott. Um, so with, with the, based on what you just said, the advocacy, uh, just putting advocacy throughout here, I think that that was something I think that we just mostly talked about because that is what we have, especially with legislation focused on, is how can we advocate. But um, I think also what we can discuss when we get, when we meet is I agree that the big P, little P discussion is, you know, that's something that we talk about and we understand that, but I think you're right that it isn't very clear in this one pager. So we can talk about that with Donna where maybe we can make it more clear about what's the big P and what's the little P. Yeah. I think that makes sense too. So yeah. thank like you that. for your feedback and it, it is appreciated. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, we do need to uh, act on this. Oh. Commissioner Hassett. I, I move that we um, send this feedback back to the committee and they come forward with um, an edited 2018 policy platform to the December meeting. I'll second. Okay, second by Commissioner Kosick. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Thank you. Beth Hassett. Aye. Lee Turner Johnson. Aye. Kathy Kosick. Aye. Paul Lee. Aye. Phil Cernan. Aye. We have a pass. Very good. Thank you. Thanks for giving it so much thought. Thank you. Huh? My feelings are so <laughs> <laughs> You did. You? No. Okay, next item, please. I didn't vote. Did I not vote? Did I vote? Commissioner Moke. I, I, yes. I'm like, did I say it and I forgot? Like, what am I, what am I, am I on? Sorry. Did I was stri stricken from the policy discussion. Commissioner? It didn't register to vote. That's the problem. I <laughs> see it is Big P. Okay, next item. I'm please. all in. Nominate and approve the 2018 vice chair. Okay. Uh, our current vice chair is uh, Beth Hassett, who um, has been, been doing, in my estimation, a wonderful job as vice chair. And as such, I'd like to nominate second. her. Second. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a nomination and a that second. Was like not it. <laughs> uh, roll call vote, please. Lee Turner Johnson. Aye. Kathy Cossett. Aye. Paul Lake? Aye. Scott Moke? Aye. <laughs> Phil Cernan? Aye. Motion passed. Yay, Beth. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Beth. Well, Ron's a good meeting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, our last item um, is uh, Commissioner uh, Comments. So, looking to my right, any comments from Commissioners? To my left, uh, Commissioner Turner Johnson. I just want to say that I was privileged to attend on October 31st the Reducing African American Infant Mortality Through Breastfeeding, a cultural legacy and perspective held at Sierra Health. And I just want to say that um, it was just a wonderful and rich experience to be there for the day. There were two main speakers. Kimberly Seals Allers comes from the East, uh, did her graduate work at Columbia, and has set up a kind of project 
here and there throughout the country to initiate such um, grassroots breastfeeding initiatives. Um, she, the, her speech was No Mother Left Behind. I think her project, I met with her, and I think her project has a slightly different name, but she's been quite successful in Detroit and somewhere in Pennsylvania, and she, she goes to the state for funding and then works with grassroots levels to really get a sort of peer support group going that continues after her, so it's sustainable in that regard. It was quite wonderful. And then Brandy Gates from the Bay Area, Oakland specifically, and she and I talk as I think some of the mothers from Head Start are probably working with her now on the same things through West and East Oakland. So it was just a wonderful day, and there were all kinds of terrific people from the area there. So thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. If there's no further comments from commissioners, no further business before this commission, we stand adjourned. Don't forget your hat.